And what happens if authorities and central banks do not want a crisis to arise under any circumstances and at the slightest sign of one, they continuously and systematically always inject more money? Well, then we face the possibility of a scenario that has played out before in history. The quantity of money injected into the system grows so much that eventually runaway inflation follows and does away with the monetary system. A case in point is the hyperinflation that devastated Germany in the 1920s. Different economists have examined this process. The most important treatise on the subject is The Economics of Inflation by the Italian professor Bresciani Toroni, who explores in detail the hyperinflation process that ravaged Germany after World War I. Throughout the 1920s, when monetary growth was such that banknote printing factories operated at full capacity for shifts of eight hours, without ever stopping during the day. They could not produce money fast enough. In fact, the value of the mark fell to a practically irrelevant fraction of its former worth. I have a few of these marks at home. The smallest denomination was one million marks, which would perhaps be equal to one euro cent. In nominal terms, all workers were multi-billionaires. They were earning tens of billions of marks, but a loaf of bread cost 100 million marks. A time came when hyperinflation was so severe that the first people in line paid one price for bread and the last in line paid another two or three times higher. What happened in the end? The mark lost all of its value and people naturally and spontaneously began to make exchanges using other monetary systems, stamps, cigarettes, etc. And before that, a monetary reform was introduced and triggered the six effects, along with a very deep recession, grave social discontent, high unemployment, etc. These events set the stage for the democratic victory of Nazism in Germany. And since the Germans have historical memory, they rightly attribute Hitler's rise to power, together with all the accompanying tragedies for their country and the rest of Europe, to the prior stage of hyperinflation. And for that reason, following World War II, they incorporated into their constitution a mandate to maintain monetary stability. In that constitution, the objective of preserving monetary stability is established for the German Central Bank. In no case is it to promote economic growth, which is a euphemism for promoting artificial credit expansion. This is the main distinction between the monetary policy of Europe and that of the United States and England, where the respective central banks do take on the responsibility of keeping the economy thriving. And this provides them with an excuse to orchestrate continual expansions of credit, which, as we have seen, seriously distort the economic process. In a way, following the Maastricht Treaty, the European Monetary Union has inherited this constitutional mandate issued to the Bundesbank, which explains why Euro monetary policy, though not free from grave errors, has been less wild and volatile than its American and English counterparts.